Hello, so welcome to our Facebook Live. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, we are um, live, we are taking your questions. This is part of the climate change commitment for Western Super Mayor Town Council. And um, I'm joined by two very lovely gentlemen. So we have Matt Hardy, who is here from uh, Western Museum, who's going to be uh, talking about an exhibition that we've got coming up with um, Stephen Boss, who is probably left right up down of me. It's really hard to tell on these, uh, on these Zoom calls. So I should just swap and make him a uh, speaker profile. So um, Stephen, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself because um, you know more about you than anyone else. <laughs> Lovely, yes, my daughter would say that. Um, my name's Stephen Moss. I style myself as an author, a naturalist. People quite often say TV producer, but I gave that up about seven years ago because it was bad for my health. So, uh, but I used to produce, Springwatch used to work in Bristol, not too far away. Um, I've lived in Somerset now for 15 years. I absolutely love it. We moved here with very three very young children and became part of the community immediately. We live in the village of Mark between Wedmore and um, Brent Knoll. Um, and it's been an absolute joy. Although, of course, one of the issues that I realised very soon after getting here is that Somerset is very low. And if we're not careful with climate change, Western Super Mayor will soon be Western Under Mayor. So uh, that's something I'm going to be talking about tonight. I also um, I'm president of the Somerset Wildlife Trust, which is basically an honorary position, but it's always very enjoyable being involved with the trust to do such fantastic work. And I also teach uh, in a place that used to be Somerset, Bath, Bath Spa University. I teach an MA in travel and nature writing there. Um, so like a lot of people, I have quite a lot of, wear a lot of different hats. I also lead Somerset Birdwatching Holidays, something I'll talk about that later. And I'm here tonight to talk about birds, wildlife and the potential effects of climate change. Brilliant. And that's a very serious thing. And I suppose that with birds, we don't really think so much about it affecting them in terms of climate change. So do you want to, um, and I definitely want to hear your, your date frame for when we may end up underwater, because that is something that does worry me, especially when I'm doing DIY home improvements. Um, so um, let's, um, let's just sort of dive in with our local birds and how climate change has been affecting them from, from what you've been able to see. Well, one of the issues in Somerset, Somerset's one of the very, very few places in Britain where the bird life is by and large getting more diverse, it's getting better. And that is mostly because of fantastic habitat creation from former peat diggings on the Somerset levels. So while we have lost a lot, like a lot of places we've lost, most of our nightingales now, turtle doves have gone, corn buntings. I suppose the irony is it's the showy birds, the birds of prey, the marsh harriers, the buzzards, that sort of thing. And in particular, a group of water birds that have been attracted by the Avalon marshes and by that whole project run by the Wildlife Trust, the RSBB, Natural England, Hawke Canal Trust, etc., and a load of fantastic volunteers. And actually, I wrote about this recently in an article for The Observer um, that I looked out the other day when I knew I was doing this. One of the other reasons the birds are here, yes, we have created this habitat and they have come and they have found a fantastic home here. But of course, we need to then ask the question, what brought them here in the first place? And in the case of three species, the little egret, the great white egret, and now the cattle egret, climate change is definitely the impulse that has driven them north. Now, had we not built the habitat, they would have not stayed. They would have gone either elsewhere in Britain or retreated back to the continent. But because we have built that habitat, they're here. And the trouble with that is that it's very easy to be very complacent about how birds are affected by climate change. Because every time I go out on the levels, I see these birds. I show people these birds. I take people out for day trips or on holidays. I take people from all over Britain, sometimes abroad. And they're stunned, of course. You know, that birds we now take for granted. Um, you know, a flock of 100 cattle egrets sitting on cattle at Catcott Lowe's or down on Teal and Moor. Um, and the sort of birds we see down on the levels and the great white egrets in particular. It's easy for us to feel both complacent and delighted that they're here, just as it is if you're interested in moths or butterflies or dragonflies or damselflies, which I am, 
there's a whole load of new species. Jersey tiger moth never appeared. Quite a rare moth in Britain. Now it's every summer I get them in my garden. So if you live in Somerset and in general in the south of Britain, you tend to feel slightly complacent about climate change. What a good thing it is. And then, of course, um, A, if you live in the north of Britain, if you live in Scotland, you can see things disappearing. You can see the problem with the snow retreating and all those things. So I wrote a piece for The Observer, which you can look up. It's called Climate Change and Wildlife. Um, it was in 2019, I think. And what it does is it, it talks about the fact that we need to be careful that we don't just use our own experience, um, which also includes for people who aren't naturalists, we've had three nice warm summers in a row, haven't we? Uh, two very sunny ones. And then last spring in lockdown, it was particularly lovely. So climate change does what uh, a scientist once called the honeymoon period. He said birds will benefit from climate change without question. Most birds will benefit in the short term when it's increasing slightly. Then you get the nightmare scenario when it tips over a certain point. And that's something I can talk about today. Nightmare scenarios, that's something I don't like the sound of. Um, so we haven't had any questions come through yet, but I'd like to encourage people, if you do have any questions, uh, you know, because this is an expert and sometimes it just takes a, a moment or two to kind of like just get your head around what's being said. But if you've got any questions, then, then, then do add, add them. So just to ask you then, tell us about that nightmare scenario. What does that look like? Well, the nightmare scenario is, of course, you know, it seems trivial to talk about birds and wildlife when it's going to affect so many people, both in Britain and Somerset and around the world. So and clearly we all know this and it, it, it's a bit terrifying. I know some of the people watching will be campaigning um, against the climate emergency, which we should call it now, not climate change, because that sounds slightly nice, doesn't it? Oh, nice, bit warmer, you know. Um, clearly, if, and I'm not going to go into the figures here, but if the temperature, the average temperatures reach uh, increased by over a certain amount and it can be argued whether that's one and a half or two degrees or whatever but around that scenario things start going very bad now I first came across this more than 20 well nearly 30 years ago I wrote a book called birds and weather and it was a guide to bird watchers on I, I'd written a couple of articles about birds and weather it was very early on in my writing career this was the first book I wrote and broadly, it was a guide saying, you know, how are birds affected by weather in winter? You know, when you get cold snaps, what kinds of exciting birds does that bring in from the continent? Which it does, you know, certain things turn up, particularly in southeast England, if it's very cold in Europe. What happens if you get very fine spring weather? You get what are called birds like Catalina, which is overshooting and arriving in Britain. So I wrote this book and then towards the end of it, I thought I'd better write about climate change because um, global warming, as it was called then, actually. And I thought I'll write um, a couple of chapters about that at the end of the book. And I did some research and I was absolutely horrified. This is 1990, early 1990s. I read a couple of American books. And I thought, oh, my God, we are just not taking this seriously at all, because it was still spoke about as about, you know, we won't need to go to Benidorm because we can sit on the beach at Western Supermare and it will be really hot all the time, you know. And clearly we we moved on a lot from that, although the tragedy is that I think if we had really taken it seriously round the year 1995, 2000, we could really have made a lot of the changes that we are now needing to make much more quickly. We wouldn't have had so many catastrophes. But one of the things I did when I was talking about birds, I, I was a little bit simplistic. I sort of took the view, and it's true, that warmer weather will bring these birds like cattle egrets I mentioned in the book, very rare then, bring them to Britain, to the southern counties. And meanwhile, birds like the ptarmigan in northern Britain uh, that live on the Cairngorms will suffer. You know, I, I, it wasn't a very positive scenario. I was saying some birds will win and some birds will lose. What I hadn't taken into account was two things. One is completely unpredictable effects of climate change. For example, if the North Atlantic drift, the current that influences so much of our weather from the Atlantic, if it did divert or stop, which is one possibility, actually we would have really, really cold winters here. We'd have a continental climate, very, very cold winters, 
pretty warm summers and that would clearly affect us and the wildlife our economy our crops what our farmers grow all those things and the second thing less slightly less dramatic than that was we've seen this what climate change does is that it creates disruption and disruption creates unpredictable weather events so last year we had the wettest february in living memory i think it was and then we had the driest april and I think this April was very dry. And we had the sunniest, not just the sunniest May ever last year, it was the sunniest month ever, which is pretty extraordinary given that in May we haven't reached peak sun as you do in June. Uh, we've had, as I say, some hot summers, but we've had the beast from the east. You know, now I know, you know, what if you if you talk about this, people always say, ah, but we've always had extreme weather events. What about the 1963 winter? What about this? And of course they're right. But what's different is the extreme weather events are increasing. Wildlife, particularly specialist wildlife, struggles with extreme weather events. It doesn't like it. Birds that are very common and adaptable, crows, wood pigeons, um, they're probably okay. Robins even, they're probably okay. You know, these are not creatures that are going to suffer from climate change but an awful lot of creatures are suffering either through direct loss of habitat you know bitterns used to all nest on the coast but almost all coastal areas where bitterns nested have been flooded from the sea and that causes salination and that means they can't breed on the coast anymore um, so a lot of creatures will die out and it will be very unpredictable what happens and the third thing which was uh, is is a bit hard to get your head around but on average springs are getting much earlier every year is different but you know, this year is certainly different but every year you know on average they're earlier if you are a great tit and you feed your young on little caterpillars and the caterpillars are hatching out two or three weeks earlier because they respond really quickly to changes you can and many great tits will nest earlier they will respond to the warmer weather and they will nest earlier and they will probably be okay but if you're a pied flycatcher and you've flown back from west africa to the quantux and you've arrived at exactly the same time as you always do in the last couple of weeks of april because migration is linked entirely to um light changes in which of course are constant rather than heat what will then happen is that those birds will arrive back at what they think is the end of April, but actually it isn't anymore. It's, it's the equivalent of the end of May because spring has moved three or four weeks earlier. The caterpillars have all hatched. They've um, pupated. There's nothing for the pied flycatchers to feed their young on. And we are seeing population crashes in a number of migrant birds, which are partly linked to this, partly, of course, to loss of habitat in Africa and in Britain, and partly to severe weather events. So, you know, we've got this sort of triple whammy. If climate, if the climate emergency was happening at a time where everything else was fine, you know, we had beautiful habitats, our farmland was wonderful for wildlife, our woodlands were perfect, we hadn't destroyed all our hay meadows and our hedgerows, then actually things could adapt. They might struggle and some might not. But of course, climate change is, it is the effectively a very large straw that's breaking the camel's back because it's happening at a time where all wildlife is under pressure, under threat from habitat loss and poisoning and all these other issues, by the you know, deliberate poisoning or poisoning of rivers and habitats. So that is another issue. So this all sounds very gloomy. I can come on to more positive things, but that that's really where we are. When you say deliberate poisoning, um, can you quantify that a little bit? Because, you know, I, did, I, I, I assume that you don't mean deliberately trying to poison birds or is that what you oh, mean? I do. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, this is a specific thing to do with birds of prey in certain parts of Britain, notably grouse moors. Basically, grouse moor owners and gamekeepers are breaking the law by poisoning, trapping and otherwise killing birds of prey that eat their grouse because the grouse are a money spinner. And they are doing it and they claim uh, at some length, and I've had big run-ins with them, I'm not the only one, Chris Pack and Mark Avery, other people have, they claim that their, their moors are very good for wildlife, um, and in some cases some of them are. But 
they are doing the equivalent of walking into the National Gallery and running a knife down a priceless painting. They're, they are killing Hen Harris purely because they threaten their economic well-being. And that's not acceptable. It is illegal. It is allowed to go on. Um, the other poison, which is probably worse, is the effect that is happening on our rivers at the moment. I mean, you know, the Environment Agency and others should hang their heads in shame. All our rivers in Britain are massively, um, you know, nitrate runoff from farming, pesticides, um, release of industrial waste. You know, it's just that it's a litany of horrific things that are happening, which means that, you know, if you make your life on a river, you are already struggling against these things. And then the climate emergency comes along and it may or may not affect you. It depends what species you are, it depends what you do, you know, but a lot of species depend on very specific temperatures to breed. And particularly when we talk about invertebrates, invertebrates respond in insects, respond very quickly to things. And sometimes, as I say, the warming will help them. I mean, unfortunately, the, the things that will help are mostly pests, what we call pests, you know, disease carrying creatures, because of course, they're not being killed off by cold winters, that sort of thing. So, you know, we, we, you know, we have an issue where there's lots of pressure on wildlife and it's quite hard to quantify because it depends on the species, what's worse. Um, modern farming methods driven entirely by consumers wanting cheap food, for example, is means there is little or no room on many farms for wildlife. Not all farms, many farmers are doing a fantastic job against the odds often to their economic um, you know, disadvantage. They are, they are making room for wildlife because they want to, but they're not being helped as much as they could be. So you know, we, have, we face two crises. We face climate emergency and we face what's called the biodiversity crisis, which usually gets ignored because the climate crisis is clearly so important. But the biodiversity crisis, in my view, is equally important and the two are extremely linked. What can we do as individuals with our gardens? Because, you know, we don't know. I often think, is putting out fat balls a good idea? Should I not be doing that? Obviously, you know, there's, there's things like people have cats as, um, uh, as pets. What advice would you give if somebody wanted to support bird life in their own gardens? Yeah, it's very easy to say, well, it, you know, like with plastic bags or anything, it won't make any difference. But it does, it does make a difference. Firstly, by doing anything to help wildlife, you feel you're doing your bit and that's a good thing. The danger is, I'll come to what you should do, but the danger is that, and George Monbiot argues this very coherently in The Guardian, that if we're not careful, by putting the onus on combating climate change on individuals, same with plastic, in all these issues, I'm absolutely not saying we shouldn't insulate our homes and do all these things and some of these things do make a genuine difference but unless society and our economic structure changes we're still doomed frankly so if we, we you know and the danger is that that the politicians and particularly the corporations some of them might be playing a very clever game where they effectively create the idea that it's all down to us you empower people but unfortunately, people can't do everything. And, and that's the danger. So feeding birds in your garden, why should you do it? I do it. I've got birds outside my window. The feeders are empty because the blooming birds have eaten them all again. So it cost me a fortune. But I will put the fat balls and the seeds out later. And I love it because what feeding birds in your garden does is it brings the birds to you. You can see them. It's like having your own little spring watch show. And it's fantastically empowering it makes you feel better it gives you know particularly people who live on their own particularly during covid people who are isolated either through through um well mostly not through choice obviously um but you know so it's very good and people and wildlife yeah that's a very important nexus people places and wildlife what i call the sort of golden triangle is very important and we when we watch birds we learn about them and we genuinely help birds birds like long-term tits survive hard winters now because there's food in gardens, black caps that winter in Britain um, do so partly because they can survive in decent numbers because of being fed. So it genuinely does help some species. Goldfinches would be another example. Um, but of course, the irony is that gardens are one of the best habitats in Britain. 
they, they have incredibly high densities of wildlife, incredibly high numbers of species. A woman called Jennifer Owen, she had quite a large garden in Leicester, about a mile from the city centre. So an urban garden. And in the course of 30 years, she found 8,000 species in it. Now, that's an awful lot of very obscure insects, clearly, because, you, you know, you're going to have maybe 40 birds. But that's not the point. The point is she found them. So gardens are very important. Um, what I call in my book, the accidental countryside, the, the, the messy bits, the roadside verges, the bits of what we used as kids called wasteland, edge lands, you know, um, bits that aren't basically ploughed or, you know, they're often abandoned pieces of land. They're often quite inaccessible, things like along the lines of railway lines, you know, you can't really get to them. They have some of the best wildlife in Britain now. Um, and they are refuges for wildlife that are incredibly important. Terribly tragic that we have to have that. I shouldn't have had to write that book. It's insane that I should have to write a book saying much of our wildlife now only finds a home in these marginal habit, man-made habitats that we have created for our own ends. Golf courses, churchyards, cemeteries, you know, um, the entire Avalon marshes. It was peat diggings. It's a post-industrial landscape. So why should wildlife have to find its home there? Why shouldn't it be in the wider countryside? And that's a, another question we need to look into. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a huge amount of serious things that, that are sort of going on that just rile you up and make you angry in what you've said. And, and certainly the bottom up approach when it comes to politics and, and how the emphasis is being put on people to change um, when actually the, the large businesses aren't being forced in any way through taxation or otherwise to actually make positive changes and one it is very tricky I think one of the things that with with the situation of Covid it's been amazing how money has come from the government to bounce back however couldn't there have been and there has been before sort of solar panel money or you know it's almost as if Covid has somehow outweighed, outweighed what you have described as being a climate emergency and I think you're right you know as a town council we've been calling it climate change but it does sound quite nice. Yeah, climate uh, crisis is quite a good one as crisis well. Is I mean, one, one of the questions is you know it's a very simple question why do not all new homes have to have solar panels and a certain level of insulation of course there are rules but they do not have solar panels and they should do it should be mandatory and we know it's because it would add a marginal cost but it would be pretty marginal. Um, I mean, I put solar panels on our house a few years ago and it cost me 13 grand. To do the same thing now would be about three grand um, because the cost has come down, you know. So, so thing, you know, the technology actually is helping us. And surely it wouldn't take very long, looking at my own um, electricity bill, it wouldn't take very long for you to recoup that three grand, surely. No, absolutely. And that, but, but also, yeah, solar panels are particularly good at that, some other things less so. But the point is, again, for new homes, it should be mandatory. The government should just say, you, do, you know, same with insulation. And, and it, likewise for wildlife, you know, why can't swift bricks be put in so that swifts can nest in all new homes? You know, again, it's just putting in a hollow brick at one point. It's not complicated. But you know, we shouldn't get onto the entire political thing. I wrote a book recently called Skylarks with Rosie, which is meant to be a very lyrical account of lockdown. Uh, and someone read it and said, gosh, you, you've become very political. And it's like, yeah, actually I have. Um, because yes, it is a nature book, but it's a nature book about three months last spring. So I, I could hardly avoid being political. Um, but you know, that's, that's it, it's a tricky one. And I, you know, I appreciate politicians have other priorities and there's lots of things but yeah nature is not an add-on it's not some bolt-on extra nature and the environment there are things that we can you know it will benefit us someone said recently supposing global warming is a hoax so just supposing some you know the figures have been manipulated by some you know weird conspiracy and supposing we do insulate all our houses and have renewable energy so we're not burning coal and causing air pollution and supposing we do all these things and um, we create a much better world and it turns out the global warming didn't exist we'd have done all these things and they'd all be benefiting people economically 
there'd be jobs, there'd be lower electricity bills, energy bills, uh, cleaner air, cleaner water, all those things. So it would actually have helped, even if, you know, of course it isn't, I hope, clearly, um, but, it, it, you know, that's, it's like it's common sense to do all these things anyway, because they help society, they help individuals. What countries are getting it right? Oh, gosh, I don't know enough about that, to be honest. I suppose, um, I mean, people always look at the Scandinavian countries. Uh, I mean, we're doing pretty well on renewable energy, for example. Um, Eastern Europe got it right for a very long time uh, in terms of wildlife because they weren't being developed. And then, of course, they joined the EU and they started developing. So, you know, there are many examples of places that are doing better than us for wildlife, an awful lot. Um, on things like renewable energy, we're actually, because we have a lot of wind and waves and a reasonable amount of sun, actually, we're doing OK. Um, and renewable energy strikes me as something that has really proven, yeah, it's now cheaper than conventional energy. It's sometimes we have days, weeks on end, I think, um, last summer, where the whole of our electricity more or less comes from that. So people 10 years ago were saying, oh, it won't work, it's too expensive, it's too impractical, it makes a mess, you know, looks horrible. I remember a young person saying to me, look, you notice electric, we know, sorry, he said, you notice wind, turbines because you grew up without them but she said I don't I'm in my 20s I don't know them because they've always been there yeah they're not they're not stunningly beautiful but they do a job and we need them you know so it's things like that so in terms of wildlife I'm a bit weird but I like them I like the way they move, <laughs> they like they move quite slowly and kind of I just love them but yeah that's it's, very, it's very hard to tell who's doing well on wildlife because by and large the countries that still have quite a lot of wildlife, they have a lot of wildlife because they're massively underdeveloped. You know, Ethiopia, Tanzania. So they're very poor. So the people are very poor. So actually, they almost, you know, they have good wildlife by accident. And that's not really good enough. We need to find sustainable systems that work for them and work for us. You know, but those countries, a lot of countries in Africa are being... The habitats are being destroyed at a horrific rate in a way that happened in Asia first and is now happening in Africa. Yeah, interesting. So I've got one final, probably um, sort of uh, question to ask you. That's a technical term. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about your exhibition and I'll hand over to Matt to talk about uh, the exhibition that's coming up at the museum. Um, but you mentioned at the start of all of this about um, Western underwater. Um, what tell, tell us a, a bit about that. I've looked at maps, but I haven't looked at the time frame of this. If there is a guesstimate time frame, have a look. Well, have a look at again. This is an argument people often use. They say, Well, yeah, the coast has always changed. Yeah, have a look at a map of, of what would have you know, isn't Somerset, but would have been you know, we call Somerset now in Roman times. And the, the coast looks incredibly different. It, it obviously comes inland much further into the marshes. So the coast has always varied. But I go down most Saturdays to the Huntsville, see what's called the Huntsville Sea Wall, although it's actually along the River Platte Parrot, the tidal bit, and obviously that incredible tidal range. And some days I go and the tide is right up. And it's a, yeah, it's a spring tide, it's up to 12 metres, and it goes right the way over the sea wall and starts going onto the fields that are not normally flooded. And you think it wouldn't take very much in terms of sea level rise. And of course, heavy storms, storm surges. If you get really heavy westerly or northwesterly gales up the Bristol Channel, you are gonna get a surge of water and it will start flooding. And I have heard, and I don't quote me on this, but I've heard people say that the M5 is the sort of limit. That's where we would retreat to, which means whole villages disappearing let alone Western Supermare, you know, but whole areas. So we don't know, but what we do know is that catastrophic tipping points occur very quickly. Glaciers are melting very quickly. The ice cap is now, the Arctic ice cap is now completely ice free in summer. It doesn't exist in summer, which it always used to. So, and of course, heating expands seawater. So even if no ice melted at all, which of course it is, you would get higher sea levels just because water expands the warmer it gets. So I think we're looking at our, in my case, my children's lifetime, certainly, that it could happen. I do honestly believe that with political will 
and technology, we could limit climate change. And if we do that, we're probably going to be OK. But we can't afford to be complacent because it really is the sort of five minutes to midnight scenario at the moment. I think unless major changes occur this decade in the way we live, and as I say, technology might help. I, I looked at an electric car two years ago, less than two years ago. Couldn't buy one because the mileage isn't enough. I don't travel very far, but I travel to Bath and back and I couldn't do it because I'd have to stop to charge it, which is, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to run out of electricity. I bought one four months ago because it does double the range that it did then. And in two years time, it will double again. I think by 2030, everyone who buys, well, before that, everyone who buys a new car will buy electric cars or hire electric cars or whatever. I'm working uh, for a big point on lamppost because yeah, yeah, they will have to live on flat thing. and flats yeah. need it. <laughs> that's the thing. I have a drive, so I can do it. Absolutely. So someone needs to be thinking ahead and saying, absolutely, every lamppost just needs a charger on, it needs to be easy to use. You know, once you get used to it, they are relatively easy to use, but there aren't enough of them, and it doesn't work if you live in Bristol or Western on a street because you can't have a cable running across. So you know, we have to make that work. It's not perfect. Of course, we should be trying to get rid of cars. But if you live where I do, you have to drive. I drive my kids around all the time. You know, I cycle a lot as well. I try to cycle, but I can't cycle my children to a place 15 miles away. You know, it doesn't work like that. We have, you know, we have to drive um, for those things. So I think, you know, technology is catching up very quickly, renewable energy, all those things. That will help hugely but we need the political will to make it happen. And the irony is, if we did that, Britain could be world leaders in this. You know, we're world leaders in technology generally. We're very inventive. We have very high standards in our universities and our um, businesses are doing this. And I, it always astonishes me why I know companies like BP and Shell are saying they're changing, but I don't understand why they don't embrace renewable energy completely because the story of Kodak film is a very salutary one. Kodak was run by middle-aged men who were obsessed with cameras. And it was a really successful company because it was run by middle-aged men who were obsessed with cameras. So they knew what films to produce. Photographers loved them, brilliant product. They had virtually the whole of the market. Digital came along 25 years ago and they went, no, never catch on. And they went bust. And that's happening with these big oil companies. You know, they. And some of them, I think, will rethink. I think, you know, some businesses are very thoughtful. I think they do care. I think they're, they're often all tarred with the same brush. But the ones that don't will, will disappear in a way that large companies who made very large computers disappeared in the 1990s when Apple came along. You know, they, they, the people who don't change will, will go. But that may be too late. Well, on a happier note... <laughs> Yes. Um, you've got an exhibition that's coming up, which uh, is, uh, is it is it in, Matt? You were telling me that it, it's currently being installed. You are on mute if you're about to start to speak. There you go. I was just having a look to see when Western Supermare will be underwater. Um, I can <laughs> report back that I haven't been able to find it as yet. Good. Um, <laughs> But as soon as I can, I will there is, report There's back. a line in one of the, uh, is that what you're looking at? Um, so so we had a, po a post from Councillor Helen Thornton, who has given us a link that shows uh, uh, where we'll be underwater by 2050. So um, she's, she's posted a map um, on the comments. So if, uh, if anyone wants to look, look at that, um, then, uh, then uh, you can do so. Um, so uh, yeah, just saving you from, from doing your homework there, Matt, by the looks of it. Thank you for that. Um, I think either way, I think it's safe to say that we don't need to be rushing out to buy wellies and snorkels in the next few months, I would say. Um, just, just before we do move on to the exhibition, if you don't mind, um, we have spoken about a lot of quite big issues, talking about big corporations, big industry, um, and obviously politics playing a part in that. I just wondered if it would be interesting for the people watching at home, if there's any anything that we can do as an individual to try and 
take the edge off where we can and hopefully as a result try and increase biodiversity in sort of our immediate surroundings especially with um, birds and wildlife well definitely you know feed birds in your garden let your garden part of it go wild i've let half mine go extremely wild um and also, you know, campaign for local nature reserves, visit your local nature reserve. I recently went to Western Airfield. I'd heard of Western Airfield. I didn't realise there was a nature reserve there. That's where I met your councillor who asked me to do this talk. Um, and it's astonishing. It's a fantastic place. I don't know if it's protected. We couldn't work out if it's who owns it. We couldn't work out if it's protected. It's the sort of place that could easily disappear. And yet it's a wonderful habitat. And it's right on the edge of estates in Western where people do go they go and walk their dogs and they go jogging and they go for a nice bit of fresh air and it could easily be transformed into a, a fantastic nature reserve so if you know it keep fighting for it and if you don't know it go and have a look and then you know what we need to do and we, we we've inquired with the somerset wildlife trust and avon wildlife trust um who owns it and is it protected because it's exactly the sort of place that could disappear and yet it was absolutely dripping with birds and wildlife it was fantastic so you know i think local campaigning and of course joining things like the protest i went my then 15 year old daughter last summer no it must have been must have been the summer before it was before covid anyway said can you know four of my friends and i want to go to the climate protest in bristol oh, great fine so we went got on the train didn't drive got on the train and went to bristol um and took part in it and it was really special and I hadn't done much of that in my previous life and my daughter is not you know obsessed with wildlife she's not obsessed with campaigning but it had reached her and her friends that we should be doing something about this and we did and I think you know we mustn't underestimate the power of lots of people getting together which I know in the west country particularly is quite strong we're quite good at this sort of thing yeah, we are very good, I would say, as, as a community to uh, come together for the things that matter the most to us, I would say. Absolutely. And beautiful segue into the new exhibition that we have here at Western Museum, um, all inspired by a piece of work of yours called Wild Hares and Hummingbirds. Um, and I think it should be fair to the audience at home to clarify the terms that we use during that, uh, the title of the exhibition. So, Stephen, do you think people coming to this exhibition will be able to see hummingbirds as they may understand that? Uh, well, it was, it was a deliberate um, book. I'll just grab it, actually. It was a deliberate um, thing. The book, the original book it's based on, which I wrote 10, 11 years ago now, uh, about my village in Mark. Um, it's called Wild Hares and Hummingbirds, The Natural History of an English Village. And I wanted people to pick it up and say, hummingbirds? And of course it's hummingbird hawk moths, which ironically have got commoner in the last few years because of the climate emergency. They, they migrate here from Spain and North Africa, as do red admirals, and they migrate here in spring and summer and they turn up, I've seen them in pub gardens, I've seen them in my own garden, um, and they, they look like a hummingbird. I mean, they look exactly, I've seen, tiny hummingbirds in, in the Caribbean that are about the same size as hummingbird hawk moth. I mean, you know, these are pretty big things. And they feed like a hummingbird and they look like one. And it's, you know, it's a great example of conversion evolution. But the point of that book and several books I've written since, particularly Skylarks with Rosie, is to talk about the juxtaposition of the local, where we live, which is incredibly important to all of us, be it you know, a town or a village or a city, where we live the people and the wildlife in that place mean something to us but some of that wildlife comes from a long way away and in both the books i wrote and in the ex exhibition you see creatures that even though last year we couldn't go anywhere they came to us so the sedge warblers from senegal the swallows from south africa the hummingbird hawk moths or the red admirals from north africa which suddenly turn up in our gardens or our local patch or our local park or overhead our farmyards for swallows you know um so yeah it's, it's a book and an exhibition very much about that connection between the local and the global which is what we've been talking about all evening that's it, it's such an important thing to obviously understand what we are talking about because i don't want people to be coming to the exhibition to obviously expect lots of tiny hummingbirds 
<laughs> the actual birds flying around the museum because unfortunately that's something that we can't guarantee um but bringing it back to the 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 animals that are the the creatures that are a uh, big focus of this exhibition the it's been brought to life beautifully by the graphic artist stephanie cole and her work is beautiful and i think really sets the message that stephen puts across not only in Wild Hares and Hummingbirds, but obviously later on in some of the other pieces that you've done. Um, I have been asked to ask you a, a quite a specific question. Cool. And I think we may have, we may have touched upon this, but to expand upon it would be lovely, um, especially as it is quite a local based question. Um, you did mention that you currently live in Mark. This is all based around the the nature and the journey through the seasons of the village of Mark. Was that an intentional correlation or is Mark somewhere a little bit more special that we need to be aware of? No, I'm mean, actually quite the opposite. It, it's obviously I'm following in the footsteps of a very distinguished tradition, um, Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, the best-selling nature book ever from the late 18th century. You know, John Clare in his village in Northamptonshire. The point about a village like Mark is that it is mostly very ordinary for wildlife. It's, it's mostly farmland. It's reasonably well managed farmland for wildlife. It's not brilliant, but it's not terrible. It's not like the pastures of East Anglia, which have literally no, you know, virtually no creatures in at all. Um, yes, it's on the level, so we have a lot of reams, so we have probably slightly more water birds than you'd get, but there's no standing water in the village. So there's not like there's a marsh. Or anything like that. So broadly, the book is about common things. Uh, it's about sparrows. It's about hares, which used to be common. <laughs> the irony about sparrows and hares, of course, is they used to be common and they're not now. Um, it's about the things that we see from day to day. And actually, the, the second book I did, Skylarks with Rosie, which I wrote last lockdown, of course, literally covers the walk from my house here for a circuit of three miles, it doesn't go further than a mile from my home. And the entire three months, virtually the whole book, not quite, because we were relaxed, weren't we? We were allowed to go a little bit further. And I went off on bike rides and things with my daughter. But broadly, it's about the ultra local wildlife. And should I tell you something? Within a mile of here, which isn't all the parish of Mark, it's, it's a mile from my home. So it's basically farmland and a, the village and a few trees. I have seen roughly 100 species of bird, 24 species of mammal, 24 species of butterfly. Now that represents between a third and a half of all Britain's birds, mammals, butterflies. It's not quite a half, but it's close. It's 30-40%. And that's the point of wildlife in Britain. If you, you know, if you take an area within a mile, certainly within five miles of your home. If you, if you lived in Western and you, you only watched wildlife within five miles of your home, you would get that sort of number of species. You've got the coast there, of course, you've got things that I don't get here, but there's probably some things I get here that you wouldn't get there. But, um, you know, so the idea is that local is really important. And it, after all, it's where we live our lives. You know, I, I do travel quite a lot, but I spend 95% of my time within you know probably when i'm watching wildlife within a mile of my home and i that's really interesting because i think that understanding what you have on your front door is so important to so many messages that we're that we're trying to convey through these series of interviews um centering around climate change because if you understand what you have on your front door you can understand those changes that have started, well, have started, have been happening periodically and gives you that appreciation. And I think that's one of the things that this exhibition at Western Museum will really start to bridge that gap and allow families to have that conversation with their children. Because I think it would be fair to say that a five, six, seven year old child may not, out of instinct, pick up this book and pop it in their book bag and take it to school with them. No, it's not, not aimed at them, but then the exhibition is, it's beautifully done. And as you say, Stephanie is extraordinary and it's, it's 
beautifully designed and conceived. It was originally at the Taunton Museum and it's, it's moved to you. So I'm really delighted because it was two years ago in Taunton. And it's, of course, last year, I think they hoped to move it somewhere last year and of course couldn't. So it's great. When, when does it open now? Is it going to be fairly soon? The exhibition itself will open as soon as Western Museum is open to the public. So quite happy to announce that it is Tuesday, uh, Tuesday coming. So just after the uh, restrictions are lifted, we will be back open to the public from 10 a.m. on Tuesday. So anybody who is watching this, anybody who's watching this later on, um, or share it around, tell your friends, tell your family. We're going to be able to be open and show this beautiful, beautiful exhibition to you from Tuesday. Um, and as, as you did very rightly say, it's not a book specifically aimed at children, but an exhibition like this helps to bridge that gap incredibly because there's so much, rephrase slightly, there will be, once we're allowed to ease the restrictions slightly further, a lot of really interesting interactivity that these that families can have, um, including, and I'm sure this is something you may see on a regular basis, Stephen, um, a trip around Mark um, uh, via bicycle. That's, That's right. Yeah, they that came the, along and, and put a, a, a GoPro, I think, on the front of the bicycle and cycled around. Yeah, which is great. You realise how bumpy the roads are, of course. That's okay. We've, we, we'll be able to use our imagination and, and stabilise that footage in our minds when we do go and visit the exhibition at Western. But there's, there's so much interactivity. It's perfect for the family. And I think something that will really help to bridge that gap and bring that awareness to families as well about what is on their doorstep, what is so precious for all of us to be fighting for um, and really try and do as much as we can to save what we have and preserve the wildlife that we have in our back gardens. Absolutely, I think it's a very important thing. And with that as a thought, I think that that can conclude our interview. Stephen, unless there's anything that you're bursting to say before we wrap it up. No, I'm absolutely fine. Thank you so much for hosting me. I've really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I hope people have found it useful. You know, it's a tricky subject. It's very big. It's slightly frightening. I'm still an optimist because we have to be, don't we? Yeah, we definitely, definitely do. Well, thank you ever so much for, for sharing your expertise, thoughts and opinions. And, and thank you, Matt. It was lovely to have a co-host uh, for a change. That was really nice. <laughs> You're very welcome. And thank you again to Stephen for joining us tonight. And thank you again for the inspiration behind our fantastic new exhibition. Great. Thank you, everyone watching, commenting, and um, we look forward to seeing you all at the exhibition. So thank you ever so much and have a lovely evening.